first of all, big thanks to Veronica and Boris. Uh, without them, I wouldn't be here um, and wouldn't be able to talk about things that I really care about, um, which is design and what uh, role design plays when crisis happens, human crisis happens. And uh, we all know what's going on in the world now. Uh, the world is on fire, even though we don't feel it right now here, but uh, lots of people are uh, suffering and dying, and uh, <laughs> this loop never ends. Um, for some reason, people just want to kill each other, a reason I don't understand. But uh, I always thought that um, designers have responsibility, uh, and they should use their creativity to, uh, to voice their opinion about what's going on in the world. Um, so I'm gonna, this is what I, I'm gonna talk about. So uh, like Veronica mentioned, I'm a, a lecturer at the American University of Armenia and I teach two courses. Uh, one course is a, uh, is a visual communication course. Um, you, my, my students, we, we, we don't have a design department, unfortunately, not yet. Uh, so my students are not students of design or plastic arts. Uh, they just uh, study English and communication in a university. Um, so it's um, when I came to study, uh, to teach at AUA, it was an, an opportunity to finally uh, bring plastic arts uh, and design into the curriculum, uh, which was a very nice opportunity. Now, uh, this, uh, this course is, um, uh, very much based on Bauhaus uh, concepts um, and it's so nice that I'm in Germany, I'm in Munich, I'm in a country where this amazing school of thought uh, comes from. So I, t I tell my students a lot about Bauhaus and the way that those amazing thinkers were shaping the visual language and the visual perception. I explain to them how do we see the world, how do we understand an image, uh, and how, why is it important to understand the structure and the laws of visual perception? Now, the second course that I teach is a, is a new course, uh, which is mythology and visual arts. Uh, two things I love the most. So, these amazing uh, stories uh, we tell each other about ourselves um, and an amazing art which has been inspired by those stories. So these are the two courses that I teach at AUA. And now I was trained uh, as, a, uh, as a painter and a graphic artist, so figurative painting is, was my thing. I mean, I, uh, for me, abstraction was always difficult because the training I got was a ver very academical training, so I was, I was taught to draw in a realistic way. Um, and this is how I still, I think, see the world. I studied a lot of plastic anatomy. And these are studies from uh, Gottfried Bames, who's also German. Uh, an amazing book I highly recommend if you want to study plastic anatomy. Amazingly drawn. Um, I don't think I've ever encountered a, a book on plastic anatomy that is so well executed. I mean, it's, uh, the style of drawing is, is aston astonishing. So I did some studies from that book uh, just to understand uh, how body functions. Um, it was, it was uh, an important book in my study. So, um, like I said, I'm, uh, my education is arts, but of course I worked in graphic design for many years and I did some concept art and I did some um, uh, matte painting for... Uh, painting for commercials and films, etc., etc. So um, I'm not really considering myself a painter, even though I studied painting for four years. The color is not really my thing. I'm more uh, black and white, not just in, in, in art, also sometimes in a way I think. But uh, it teaches me how to understand the function of light and color in, in overall composition. So I'm not, I'm not a painter, I'm more a, a graphic artist, I would say. Now I did uh, uh, a lot of branding and uh, visual identity for different uh, agencies, and these are works that I did when I was living in Israel. I, did, I worked for post-production for many years, so did shot designs for commercials, um, and it's always interesting to work 
with a moving image because there are so many different factors that come to play when it's not static, when things are moving and uh, you have to consider a movement of the camera and the position of uh, uh, in a shot, so quite complex but very, very interesting. It doesn't matter in the end of the day uh, what we do because it is, I believe, visual storytelling. It doesn't matter the medium you're using. It can be a photography, it can be film, it can be anything it, it can be. It is a story. Unless it tells a story, uh, I don't think it's that interesting. So the, the primary thing is the message and it's always been uh, my deep belief that, that that matters the most. Now, um, at some point I really was tired of digital and I moved uh, back, I retreated to analog and I started to practice calligraphy that was important for me because I think that um, leaving letters, letters drawn on paper, uh, first of all they matter a lot when it comes to type design and I think that the experiment on paper is essential for typography. Um, not any calligrapher can become a typographer because there are lots of, of course, you understand a lot of technical aspects to that, but uh, to my students, I always tell them that they need to experiment, they need to work in analog format before they approach digital type design. Now, script is, uh, calligraphy is a script in its purest form. Um, it, it does require a lot of focus and concentration when you work at it. So I, I spent many years in Israel uh, and at some point I realized that I can't live anymore without my culture, so I moved back to Armenia uh, in 2010, which was already 12 years ago, and um, this is uh, actually interesting is a is a mirror of the image in the back yeah <laughs> that's the big one that's the small one yeah we call this mountain Masis in Armenian and it's the Bible uh, the biblical mountain um, so I would say that after the reset life started again in this part of the world um, now Armenians have a long tradition of writing uh, a fantastic tradition actually because um, we were producing a lot of illumination for, uh, for manuscripts, quite complex and uh, inspired, I would say. Um, not necessarily perfect technically, um, because sometimes you see Greek Orthodox manuscripts, that's just amazing. You look at it and you say, oh my God, how did they actually manage to paint that in that size on paper? But I think there is something special about Armenian uh, illumination, which is m more immediate, which is more naive, which is more, it uh, doesn't try to be that formal, and in that way I think it's very special. So, uh, I was always like seeing letters around me, and when you go to Armenia, and I hope if you haven't been, you should definitely come and visit, you see letters everywhere. You see letters on stones, we use them on ceramics, um, we carve them on wood, and uh, yeah, weave them on fabric, as well as uh, mint them on coins. And these are coins that have Armenian letters on them. It's from the kingdom of Kilikia, uh, which is the modern part of Turkey. Um, and of course, this is something very special. That is the Armenian, unique Armenian music notation that is using um, signs together with Armenian letters to write down music. We don't do that anymore. Um, but we used to do that for many, many centuries. Now, one thing was strange to me when I uh, came back because I, was, I kept asking myself, how come we have a unique alphabet, we have a um, rich writing tradition, but a failing modern practice? And I thought to myself, it's got to be the, edu the, the education. It's the only reason for the failing uh, modern practice. So, and that's exactly the reason why it doesn't really go ahead. Now, let me tell you a short story and um, it's kind of interesting. So, in, in this map, which is a late Babylonian map, Armenia is the only surviving state. It's actually, you can see it right there. Um, to the date, it's the only country that is still around. 
And it seems that, uh, that an, uh, an Armenian king from an uh, ancient kingdom of Arata would be directly involved in the creation of writing. And how did that happen? That's very curious. So Gilgamesh, and I'm sure you've all heard about uh, the epic of Gilgamesh. It's 4,000 year old, uh, oldest story that survives uh, to this day. Describes a very strange situation. So the Shumerian king wants to make a vessel state of Arata, and he sends, uh, for, uh, and he doesn't want to go to war. He wants a different kind of war. He wants a war of nerves. So this is the first time uh, it's recorded actually uh, in an epic. So what does he do? He sends a messenger to Arata demanding you know, submission, gold, precious stones, etc., etc. And the message is a verbal one. And it's answered in a verbal way too. So it provokes an escalating verbal argument between two people that are very far apart from one another. Now, at some point, the messenger becomes verbally overwhelmed because he cannot tell the story anymore. One king tells him, okay, you go and tell him that, and then he comes back and says, well, he answered this. So this goes back and forth until he's frustrated, so he takes clay and writes a message on it. And there is a passage in Gilgamesh, actually, you see that on the screen right now, that describes this. This is the first time in history that creation of writing is actually recorded in a, uh, in a poem. It was a war, a war of nerves, and um, it looks like uh, this quote is very much uh, true, because the beating of the war drums seems to be the uh, the most persistent sound that humanity has ever experienced. Now, this immense destruction that uh, Europe experienced in uh, two great global wars uh, actually shook the Western civilization to its foundations because uh, the destruction was immense. Not just the destruction of the infrastructure, but also human losses. It was a uh, terrible uh, part of history, of human history, and uh, I don't think we really ever recovered from that. So what was happening, what was going on during the war um, created so much fermentation in a human society that uh, sh uh, really changed the, uh, the, the landscape in which humans uh, lived. So a lot of avant-garde movement uh, spurred from that, and of course you know the Russian constructivism and the uh, avant-garde uh, suprematism and Tatlin and uh, Malevich, and all of them were reacting to the carnage of the war that was happening, happening on the background, the civil war that was happening in Russia at that time after the revolution. So it seems that Lenin, uh, Lenin had a nice quote about it. He said that the war is a great accelerator of things. So ironically, war caused a great acceleration in, uh, in a visual culture, and a lot of art was produ produced at that time. Now, West responded to that with uh, surrealism and Dada. Um, and here we have the Max Ernst uh, surrealistic uh, collages uh, that were done approximately at that time. All right. I was living in Amsterdam for, uh, for some time, about 20 years ago. And it looked like uh, I quickly realized that Dutch have no uh, opinion about Armenian genocide. They actually knew very little about it. I, I, I'm sure some of you know the difficult history Armenians have uh, in, in Ottoman Turkey that million and a half Armenians were slaughtered during the First World War. So um, we decided to launch uh, a graphic poster competition that would talk about this subject and actually educate people about the story that Armenians, a difficult story that Armenians have. Hopefully Dutch would, uh, uh, would take it to their heart and maybe no, uh, maybe be interested in that, and eventually uh, maybe uh, Holland would recognize Armenian genocide. So, um, absolute denial poster got me in trouble with Turkish lawyers. Uh, I started receiving letters from them demanding uh, that I remove it from uh, from the web. Uh, the answer was short, no, uh, and. 
The poster on the, uh, on the left is, uh, is called The Dark Chain of Human History, and that's, I think the message is quite clear that the racism was always the key component in, uh, in, in any genocide that ever happened in, in history. Um, that poster actually uh, got printed in New York Times, uh, and I had to update it. I had to update this poster with Darfur genocide that happened in 2003, and I'm afraid that's not the last time I have to change this poster because things don't look very good. The poster on the, on the right um, is dedicated to the, uh, one of the few cases of resistance uh, Armenians, a group of Armenians uh, took up arms, went up the mountain, and resisted Turkish army for 40 days until they were rescued by French Navy. And that story inspired Franz Werfel to write a book which was called The 40 Days of Musadag, and that book in its turn inspired the, uh, the fighters of the, of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising in 1943. They were reading Franz Werfel's book uh, about Armenians that were fighting against the regular army in very small numbers without food and water for 40 days they managed to resist. So we kept on working. This project started 20 years ago and a lot of different people from different countries contributed to this project, uh, international designers, not necessarily Armenians. Uh, it was an open call and I was very happy to see that people were not indifferent to our cause, because in the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Are you Armenian or uh, Russian or Ukrainian? We're all human beings. And when we see human suffering, we must respond. We must react to it. It's our obligation as human beings. To me, the situation was, uh, I kept asking myself, why do we struggle with visual culture? There's got to be a reason for it. And I think for me, the re uh, from my perspective, the reason is that when very important developments were happening in Europe at that time, you know, the Bauhaus school and all the explosion of cre creativity in Europe, Armenians at that time were going through forced relocation and genocide. And for me, the thread of culture is is ripped right there and then. We did not really ever recover, uh, even though we survived the genocide, but uh, I don't think we recovered fully. And especially when Soviet Union collapsed uh, 30 years ago, those 30 years were very, very difficult 30 years, especially, uh, particularly in the aspects of visual culture. We experienced very slow progress, uh, bordering stagnation, um, we desperately needed new ideas, we desperately ne needed new approach, uh, we needed a revolution. A revolution came in 2018, but it wasn't a cultural revolution. I was hoping for a cultural revolution. Instead, it was a tectonic shift that proved to be almost fatal for us as a nation, and we are still going through this process. It's a, um, it's curious that I, I'm, I'm going to go back to Armenia in two days. I'm not sure if uh, we're going to have the same prime minister when I go back. So things are very, very uh, difficult right now for us. Nevertheless, in 2018, uh, people took to the streets. You see the numbers, like it was an incredible movement. Uh, people believed that, that uh, we are ripe for change. And I somehow managed to take this energy and convert it to physical form. I was working constantly day and night to create posters so that people could take them to the streets and, uh, and use them as, a, as an expression of how they feel about the things that are going on right now. I, I wrote a lot for them at that time, <laughs> got a lot of practice on writing these words. So, interestingly, once I took the posters out, I never saw them again because people just took them home. So somehow they felt that these posters reflect uh, the general feeling of the people and uh, they saw maybe a little bit of art in them and they just took them home and they went back to my studio and just kept writing again and again and again. I don't know how many posters I produced in about a month of time, but lucky for me, a photographer caught this one because I, I, I didn't even remember wh what did I do because I, I was just giving them away and uh, I have this photograph of this uh, single work that I've never seen since uh, I let that go. I also produced uh, posters not just in Armenian but in, 
in Latin, in English, because it was important to, uh, for the f uh, foreign media to know what's going on in Armenia at that time. And this poster is, uh, um, is, is talking about uh, the power we have as consumers, because at that time we were calling for the boycott of the oligarch businesses that were supporting the corrupt government. And uh, I think that once people unite uh, uh, um, around the common, common goal and common idea, they have uh, immense power. We just don't realize it because we're pulled too far apart. But once we come together, uh, we, have, uh, we can change things. Now, this quote of Th Thomas Jefferson uh, uh, resurfaced in my memory. Uh, and I, I employed a lot of tension, visual tension, in this work. Uh, the text says, when injustice becomes a law, resistance becomes a duty. Um, I made text at times uh, difficult to read. I did that on purpose. Uh, I could have r uh, written it in a different way, but I wanted to express the, um, the meaning of the work, the injustice that we felt at that time, and, uh, and the duty that we have as a citizens to, to protest, do not agree, uh, fight against this injustice in any way that is possible. Um, a lot of work has been done at that time, and um, uh, I look at it with a little bit of nostalgia, although, uh, yeah, uh, we were very, very wrong about things that were happening at that time. I tried different, uh, different things. I tried, I, I wasn't really thinking about legibility sometimes. I was just trying to create art at the, in uh, difficult circumstances. For example, this work is called The Birth of Freedom. Uh, uh, toward the end, a lot of the work I was doing was purely intuitive. And I told you, I'm a figurative painting, painter. Abstraction is not really my thing. And it was a big discovery for me that I realized that I can produce intuitive work. If I just do not allow the cognitive process to interfere in the creation, if I just let go of control, all of a sudden it takes over. And I produced this work, which to me was a pure discovery, because even if I wanted to draw this, I couldn't. I put a very big piece of PVC on a table. It took me about 45 seconds to do this. I took a very big pump marker. I used a lot of energy on it. And once I was done, I put it next to the wall. I looked at it, and I was shocked, I think. You see what I see, right? I see a two-headed dragon with uh, one pointing in one direction and the other looks the other way. So this was the time when, uh, when this revolutionary movement was experiencing a big pushback from the, from the corrupt regime. So I call this work counter-revolution and it kind of expressed the, the danger that we all felt at that time. Then came the war. Two years later, Armenia was attacked. Uh, part of Armenia was attacked by the Azeri uh, army. Um, a devastating war, um, and uh, the same as uh, in 2018, I kept working day and night. Everybody was doing whatever they could. I mean, some people were just volunteering, giving, uh, giving away uh, the, uh, anything they could just to help uh, the soldiers to keep fighting. I was doing what I was doing, and I had to t keep teaching. It was surreal, because we were like going to the university when the war was happening on the background, and uh, I kept telling my students that you need to keep studying, because your study will ensure the, uh, the victory in the future. That was very important. I, uh, on the second day of war, I took uh, a pen, and quickly wrote this word in Armenian, which means the intent to win a victory, as if. Um, and I, I, I didn't even try to make it pretty in any way. I was just, it was important for me just to write it down. And when, uh, when I looked at it, when it was done, I felt that it's right, because every letter looks like a soldier to me. Every letter is different from the other, and they are not very stable. Um, they look a little bit awkward, one is thinner and the other one is thicker, etc. But all, together, uh, there was some conviction in it and I liked it and people liked it as well. Um, so, 
the recognition of this Armenian enclave that was uh, attacked by the Azeri army was not really feasible from my point of view, but that was the, what our government was saying, that we need to push for that and we, we listen to their call without really questioning it. In the midst of the fighting, uh, me and my friend decided to go to uh, an Armenian town and paint a mural on the wall. It was an incredibly difficult trip. Uh, because imagine bombs were falling not so far from us and we just get, got into the car and drove over there. We arrived to this deserted city. Uh, there was practically nobody outside and decided to paint quickly on a wall because we didn't have much time. There was some lull in fighting at that time. So it took us about 45 minutes to finish it. It's quite large. Uh, just for you to understand the scale, you can see the, the letter in the, in a corner, so the letters were very large. Anyway, once, once it was over, some soldiers came to us and said we have to leave quickly because the sound of bombardment was coming closer and if we stayed uh, longer, we probably would, uh, would fall under the bombs. Uh, before driving off, I took a last look at the, at the wall, I've, uh, I cannot go there anymore because the city does not belong to us anymore. It was surrendered uh, to the enemy. Uh, just the day after a huge bomb fell in front of that uh, wall, leaving a crater as big as the building itself. Uh, so I guess we were lucky that we made it out. Now for some, uh, my work found uh, some resonance among the people in Armenia and abroad as well. So these photos are, were sent to me from Los Angeles, so people seem to connect to what I was doing at that time. Another idea came to my mind at that time that I felt that Armenians are not just fighting for themselves, they're fighting for everybody as well, because we were attacked, we did not provoke that war. Uh, so I thought, that it's a good idea to write down Armenia also fights for you. I did it in German, interestingly. <laughs> I also did it in Hebrew because the idea was that I would use different scripts to pass on the same message. I just didn't want to write it by hand because I wasn't sure if I can do it that well as if uh, I would do it in my own script. So I said use typography. I did it in, in, in Hebrew, I did it in German um, and in different scripts um, as well. A few days before the end, um, a friend of mine who's one of the best chess players in the world uh, asked me to design a little logo for him. Uh, he wanted to play chess with the refugee kids from Artsakh. So, and the, and the idea was to uh, a play on words because Czech mate, mat in Armenian means a finger. So he wanted to show the finger to the terrorism, which we thought that our opponent is using terrorism against, uh, against us. So I designed this little thing, and it was a beautiful sunny day in Yerevan when he played chess with the kids, and they were so happy because they met their idol right there, and he was playing chess with them. So anyway, um, it was a very sensitive and happy moment for everyone. And then came the end, there came the humiliating uh, surrender. Now, that was probably the hardest thing that we, uh, we could experience. And I wanted to do something about it. I understood that our government is refusing to take any responsibility for this defeat because they just want to hang to power. They want the chair. I said, the chair needs to be destroyed. So I asked my friend uh, to help me photograph this. I took a chair, we put it on the top of my garage, I put poor two liters of petrol on it, and uh, I just want to show you the making of of this poster. Uh, it's difficult to describe the feelings I had at that time, because this thing was burning in front of my eyes, and it was so symbolic because this chair represents power. This chair represents everything that I hate about power, that power corrupts. And uh, seeing it burn made me immensely happy. Um, and in the end, we took about 200 photographs from which we picked uh, one. 
In the end, this chair burned down and collapsed. Um, uh, some pieces of it still lying on the top of my garage even two years after this and as a constant reminder that uh, this was, was important. It was an important expression, uh, an opposition to the, to the corruption that, uh, that still uh, persists. So I don't want to, uh, uh, to be so gloomy. Uh, I met Boris. Uh, in 2017, during Guranishan, leaving letters in Yerevan. Um, that's how our friendship began, and that's the reason why I'm here today. And what was interesting at that time, when we were preparing for the Guranishan conference in Yerevan, I worked with uh, kids in Tumo Center to produce a calligraphic map of Armenia, which was printed seven by five meters and hanged in the Tumo Center. Uh, the most interesting part about this project was the fact that the 15 children uh, did a research about their own culture. They practiced calligraphy for seven months and produced this uh, quite incredible calligraphic map of the cultural heritage uh, in the borders of the greater Armenia. Um, and uh, this was an uh, unforgettable experience for them. Now, this was also, uh, in my mind, was important because I wanted to prepare a ground for uh, creation of a variable calligraphic open typeface, uh, truly calligraphic in nature, that would have a lot of ligatures uh, and would, be, uh, would imitate uh, handwriting, so to speak. Um, and I hope one day this project will, uh, will happen and will not stay purely as a concept. We push on, and I'm happy to say that uh, Type Thursday, which is a worldwide event, it happens once a month uh, all over the world. It started to happen in Yerevan as well. We are almost a year uh, um, since this project started, and a former student of mine took upon herself. She was one of those kids five years ago that was working on a map. She, she took upon herself to organize this, uh, this process, and uh, I bow in front of her and this amazing new generation. Thank you.